Thank you, everyone. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, over the last few months, the NHS has rolled out the biggest vaccination program in its history. And locally, thousands of people, literally thousands of people have received their first vaccination. And every day, more and more are called on, uh, called upon to have the vaccination at one of our three uh, vaccination sites for that particular jab. And I know so far of the over 80s, over 8,000 out of the 11,000 over 80s in Redbridge have received um, their first jab. And of course, some have received a second as well. The NHS staff are working around the clock to deliver the, the vaccines. And of course, I, on behalf of everybody out there, cannot thank them enough for the wonderful job that they're doing. This month, uh, my mother-in-law uh, was vaccinated at the town hall, so I got to see firsthand how the health professionals are working around the clock, really making it so that we are safe as time goes on. And the attention that they paid to every single visitor who came through the door. I want to particularly thank our local healthcare partners, Redbridge CCG, BHRUT, the Barking, Havering and Redbridge University Trust, and of course, Health Watch uh, Redbridge, who are delivering the vaccination programme right on our doorstep. We must all keep in mind that the programme is a marathon. It's not a sprint, and we need to be really mindful of that because this is going to go on for some time. Although thousands are already protected, it will take a long time for us to receive the vaccine. And so we have to be patient because this is not going to happen over and overnight. And in the meantime, we do need everything. We need to, to do everything we possibly can to protect ourselves and the people around us. That is really important. And as a council, we've been working hard to protect local people. Our public health and enforcement teams are out on local streets, inspecting businesses, enforcing COVID restrictions and giving out health advice and masks to our residents who perhaps haven't been uh, adhering to the rules. We also have teams going door to door, offering the COVID rapid COVID tests, knocking on doors. And I think at the moment they're in the Seven Kings area. If someone from the council knocks at your door, they'll be wearing a high-vis vest, an ID, a mask and gloves, and they will not ask for any money or anything like that. They will offer you a test. We also have a bus patrolling the borough, sharing key messages on COVID, how to stay safe. We currently have three vaccination centres in the borough, three permanent testing sites at Mild May Road Car Park, Chartres Road and Gansill Library. And we have lateral flow test centres at Redbridge Library, Wanstead Youth Centre and at Hainault Library. We also have two mobile testing units. The one from Ken Ashton Square has been now been moved to the Mayfield uh, Leisure Centre because that's where the infection rates were the highest. And of course, we got the one in uh, Cranbrook Children's Centre. And I'm absolutely delighted that the infection rates in Redbridge are slowly starting to decline on a daily basis, which is the direction we wanted to be going in. The last, you know, last week, nine people died every single day. That is what we're fighting against. You know, we've got to be keeping ourselves safe. It could be your neighbour, your friend, a colleague, it could be somebody in your family. We need to stop the spread of this virus and we must all carry on playing our part. You know, just because the vaccine is here, we can't simply switch off. We worked so hard for the last 11 months, we've got to work a little bit longer. So remember, wash your hands, cover your face, stay two metres away from people you don't live with. And of course, keep your rooms ventilated. That's important. Stay, as, stay at home as much as possible and only leaving if you have to. We can outlast COVID-19, but only if we follow the rules. Today, we want to talk through the situation with COVID locally, go through the steps we all uh, can take to keep ourselves safe, our family members safe and our friends safe. 
and give you an up-to-date vaccination program that's been run by our NHS. We also want to hear from you, so please, if you haven't already submitted your questions in the chat, do so and they will get answered. We have a fantastic panel here today. Of course, we've got uh, Councillor Mark Santos uh, and our own Public Health Director Gladys. And of course, we've got uh, the wonderful Dr Anil Mehta, uh, Chair of the Redbridge Clinical Commissioning Group, who's been personally administering COVID-19 vaccines to local residents. And we've got Dr Magda Smith, the Chief Medical Officer at Barking, Havering and Redbridge University Hospitals Trust. Uh, these are experts. So now is the time to ask the questions you've always wanted to ask about the virus, about testing, about vaccinations. Firstly, I'm going to hand you over to Gladys Xavier, our Director of Public Health. Gladys, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Jas. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming today. So I'm going to have two hats. I'm going to start off my with my half my glass half full hat. So as Councillor Atwal has mentioned, our current rates, they are coming down. The new cases are coming down, which is good news. But if you remember, sort of when I was talking to you, sort of our rates after Christmas went up really, really high. There are quite a few reasons for that, because that was the time we uh, the new variant was identified in Kent and London. So at that time, we were talking about 1,600 uh, people per 100,000 uh, cases every si every single week. Now that has come down to just over 800. So that is good news, but however, that is still very high. But then if I put my half um, empty glass on, I would say, but there are, we are seeing still several areas where some age groups, they are going up, especially between the ages of 20 and 35, or even up the higher age group. We are seeing that going up. So it's not shifting down. Where we have seen a reduction, I think it's in the 0 to 15 since lockdown and schools. So there's a long way to go. So when I first started, we, we, we talked about uh, targeting wards, but all our wards, because this was a new variant, it was highly contagious, it was easily transmissible, so it just passed on from person to person. So since we started the lockdown and taking all the other precautions, we are seeing uh, the cases coming down, which is a really, really good news. Now, talking about new variants, you would have seen in the news, uh, there's the UK variant, and then there's also the mention of the South African variant, and then there's one from the uh, from Brazil. Now, that, Viruses always change. There's nothing new to viruses. That's how they behave. So at the moment, the good news is talking about vaccinations. The current vaccines we do have do work for us. So it's really, really to be encouraged. But at the same time, what I would say to all of you is don't look at vaccines as giving you complete protection. You still have to take all the precautions. So I know there is the, uh, the first dose and the second dose, but we know even after the second dose, you can, you, you, you know, you, you need some really good level of uh, protection. So you can still transmit it. So don't use it. Uh, it's good news with the vaccines, but you still need to take care. So, and the other thing, uh, Councillor um, Atwell also mentioned to you is about testing. So we have what we call the lateral flow device testing, which gives you the results uh, in a short time. Again, that is about reducing the risk. It is not about, so when we know somebody's positive, then we will make sure they are is uh, isolating for 10 days and all their contacts are isolated. By doing that, you have been doing that very well. That's why we are seeing the reduction. You break that chain of infection. So it's really, really important. So there are, for us to come through this, we need to do continue to do what we are doing and we can't give up. But I would also urge, urge you to, sort of, I'm, uh, I'm sure our panel members will tell you, when the time comes for you, when you're invited for your vaccination, please take, the, take up the offer. Thank you. Thank you, Gladys. Um, really appreciate the information. And now I'm, I'm going to invite Dr Magda Smith to speak. Magda, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jazz. Um, so 
Absolutely. First of all, can I just echo what has already been said, which is about to say thank you for everything that you're doing um, to um, maintain social distancing, um, staying safe um, and complying with the rules. It is actually really making a difference. Um, we, we reached our peak of hospital admissions um, over the Christmas and New Year period and um, are starting to see those fall, although still people are very, very sick. So everything that you can do um, is, is absolutely welcomed and appreciated. Um, but I just wanted to talk a little bit about the vaccines. Um, so, so I suppose the first question is, you know, what's, what's the point of a vaccine? Um, and sort of what does it do? And why, why are we promoting this so heavily? Um, our bodies are amazing and they are fighting off um, invasion by infections all the time, every single day. But if an infection really takes hold, and that includes COVID-19, then you get a type of immune reaction in the body, um, which means it's like an emergency response to an invasion, um, for example, with a virus. And that em emergency response gets going. Its, its aim is to try and kill the virus. And it, all sorts of things get produced in the body. And that's what makes you feel really, really ill. But one of the side effects of that, if you like, is that it also um, that response can damage um, normal tissue. And if that response is overwhelming, that's when people get really, really sick and end up in our intensive care units. But what the body then does once it's had an infection, it has a second type of immune response. And that's what we call an adaptive response. In other words, the body has learned to recognize that attacker and it can produce a response to that attacker if it turns up a second time round much more quickly and more effectively. So the idea with a vaccine is to introduce enough information about that attacker to the body before that attacker actually arrives. And we do that through vaccines. So what the vaccine is doing is, if you like, giving the information to the body about what the COVID-19 virus looks like so that the more rapid immune response can start really, really quickly. And in many cases, your body doesn't even feel that and wouldn't know that that virus had tried to get back through the door again. And that adaptive response is the response that then gets remembered for an amount, a certain amount of time. It depends what the attacker is like. Um, it depends what type of virus it is, for example, as to how long that response remains in the system. We know that when people have had COVID-19, we think that about six months, people continue with immunity after COVID-19. Uh, COVID and we hope and think that the virus, uh, that the vaccines will do the same thing, but we're in the early stages. So although many millions of people have received the first dose of vaccine around the world, all of our immunologists and all of the experts are still continuing to track and review and look at how long the vaccine may provide protection for, because some vaccines like measles, mumps and rubella, you get given it once um, as a child and never again. Other vaccines like flu, we want to give every year, and that's for all sorts of reasons. And we don't know yet with the COVID vaccine if it has to be repeated and how often. So at the moment, there are two vaccines that are licensed in the UK. One is made by Pfizer, one is made by AstraZeneca, and a third, Moderna, is coming online. There are another, I think, six to seven vaccines in the pipeline as well. They they have the same effect. They do the same thing in terms of providing immunity. They do it in slightly different ways, but basically they're in introducing information about the virus into the body so the body can to develop that adaptive, that second type of more rapid immune response should that virus actually appear on the doorstep. The first dose of the vaccine is effective after a couple of weeks. Um, and the studies would suggest that between 75 and 89 percent of people will have a good level of immunity even after the first dose. But obviously we want to be giving the second dose um, to get up to 95 percent of effectiveness. Now at the moment, um, the, the government, because of the priority of getting the first dose into everybody is so high, the government wants to make sure that um, we give the first dose to everybody and we delay the second dose by 10 to 12 weeks 
but that's to make sure that everybody gets that opportunity and certainly our higher risk groups. Um, I've had my first dose. Um, I'm a healthcare worker um, and in line with other healthcare workers, I've had my first dose and I went to our vaccination hub and I think they're all very, very similar. I get asked a series of questions about my health to make sure I'm OK, to make sure that I've not had any serious allergic reaction to previous vaccines, um, because that is probably one of the very few reasons not to have this vaccine. But then I sat down, the nurse spoke to me, I get a little cold swab on my arm, a very quick injection. I have to sit and wait for 15 minutes just to make sure I'm OK. And I was, and then I, I went home. So that's how the vaccine happens and it's all done through the hubs. In terms of safety, I think people, um, people are very anxious because these vaccines didn't exist 18 months ago and they've been developed incredibly rapidly. And when you look at the history of vaccine development, but people will say it takes years. But these vaccines have been developed so rapidly because there's been everything thrown at getting their, them developed through the phases. Every vaccine has to go through three phases. It has to go through what they call preclinical phases, so all the laboratory testing. And then it has to go through clinical trials, phase three clinical trials. And all of the vaccines that are approved for use have been through those trials. And there are very, very robust mechanisms in this country. The MHRA the joint and the Joint Committee on, Committee on Vaccinations who scrutinise every bit of evidence around these vaccines um, before they actually are allowed to be approved for use. Once they're out there, which they are now, there's also a very robust process of collecting all the information about um, what's happened with the vaccine? Have there been any side effects? Are there any reports of any, any issues? And that's closely monitored. And believe you me, for, for this particular set of vaccines, it is intensely monitored at the moment. In terms of what do I tell people about side effects? Well, probably one in 10 people may get a mild side effect. That could be a sore arm lasting for two or three days. It could be feeling a bit tired um, for two or three days up to a week a slight headache. Um, those are probably the main ones, actually. Uh, the, the big, big trials where some people got the vaccine and some people got a placebo or not the vaccine, in terms of serious um, adverse events, it was about equal in both groups from the biggest vaccine trial that was held um, for Pfizer in particular. But that is continuing to be monitored. And people will say, well, we don't know about the long term side effects of the vaccine. And that is very, very true. But these vaccines are all, have all gone through recognised development. And what I would say to that is, no, we don't. But we do know about the short term effect of COVID. And you've heard about the number of people who've been getting COVID and sadly, the number of people who've been dying. But we also know that people are getting a condition called long COVID. So we may not absolutely know about the long term side effects of the vaccine, but we do know that people can get long COVID. So that's the impact of the disease going on for months and months and months. So all of these, this is to promote people and advise people to get vaccinated. I know that there's some anxiety amongst communities around what's in the vaccine. And I can absolutely assure you there are no animal products, no human products. There's no egg, no gelatin, no alcohol of any any description in any of these vaccines. So they are perfectly safe to be used in all communities um, and they have been endorsed, for example, by the British Islamic Medical Association and other faith groups have endorsed the use of the vaccines. And the last thing Gladys just mentioned um, in the southeast, um, um, going through December and over the Christmas period, we saw the, this new strain which is more infectious than the previous strain of COVID and has swept through our population. And I, like many people, wanted to know, well, do the new vaccines work against this new strain? Because it's a slightly different um, um, form of the virus to that we saw previously. And the answer is yes. So I would really strongly encourage you, your communities, when you're called to come and have the vaccine, but I would also emphasize what Gladys said as well, the vaccine does not mean we can take our guard down. We need to get enough people vaccinated to bring this under control. And in the meantime, hands, face, space remain critical. Thank you. Thank you, Magda, for a, a, 
a detailed sort of uh, analysis and detailed uh, mm -hmm. facts about the vaccine. Really appreciate it. There are so many questions coming in. Um, but before we go into the question and answer session, can I ask um, Dr. Anil Mehta uh, to, to speak, please? Um, mm -hmm. Certainly, we're very, um, very appreciative of all the great work that you've done along with your colleagues, um, people on the front line. I think, um, you know, history will judge you guys as the proper heroes who delivered when the country was in dire straits. And we thank you for that and thank you for coming online today. Councillor Arwell, well, thank you so much. And Magda, thank you for making the science so clear in everybody's head. That was very, very easy to follow. Um, so, uh, Councillor Atwell, really appreciate uh, allowing us to come on today just to re-emphasise what's been going on and what you've uh, told us so far. And I think uh, the one thing I'd like to get across is that actually we're quite hopeful now because uh, almost 12 months ago we had no vaccination programme. Um, January 2021, we have two fantastic vaccines in our possession that we will just have to go and administer to all those priority groups. Now, just to sort of uh, simplify things, we are guided by the Joint Committee on Vaccinations and Immunizations, that's uh, the advisory committee to the government, and, um, and, and we follow their advice and guidance. And they give us the priority groups that need to be vaccinated first and foremost. So uh, we're, we're concentrating on our over 80 year olds, our care home residents, our frontline health and social care workers, our 75 year olds, and now we're going on to our 70 year olds and those that are clinically vulnerable with long term medical conditions. And before coming online, I've just done two and a half hours of housebound vaccination in the Barkinside area. So we've got three centres in Redbridge and Redbridge can be very proud of what's happened so far because we've actually made some tremendous gains. We've got the Ilford Town Hall, which is a vaccination centre, the James Hawkey Hall in Woodford and the Four World Cross Medical Centre in Barkingside. So these three centres are delivering vaccination at its maximum and pe people would have heard of the figure of 140 jabs per minute being administered across the country which is a phenomenal amount and there are some this is actually a race against time in terms of how many people in that vulnerable cohort of people can be vaccinated in a timely way to prevent the pressure on the nhs exceeding what it can deliver so we really are absolutely geared up to deliver this and this is the most important thing that the nhs has done in my lifetime so far so you can rest assured that groups of doctors in the community our hospital colleagues consultants are working 24 7 to deliver this massive program um, the pressure is is incredible you'll all have read and, and heard about the pressure on the nhs we're all trying to preserve that nhs that that's delivering at its at, at its absolute maximum at the moment we know that the vast majority of the people that suffer this disease in a terrible way are the elderly so we focus on the elderly first and foremost uh, to date we've delivered uh, nationally we've delivered over four million doses and despite all the difficulties we've had in the pandemic so far i you know we must remain hopeful that actually that this is a very very seismic moment for us and we just need to concentrate on the work in hand and not be deflected about with, with other things that are going on we will ensure that in the community every care home resident is vaccinated by the end of january we'll ensure that over 70 year olds and frontline staff workers and the and the vulnerable are vaccinated by mid-February and as as your CCG chair in Redbridge I'm sort of held to task with that sort of deadline and I'm busy sort of pushing out that message to groups of general practitioners in the community nursing staff all our allied staff are doing a tremendous amount of work so we're we're focused on those deadlines um, you'll be invited to to, the, to get vaccinated by your your GPs. You'd be you'd be um, directed to attend those three centres. When you do attend, it's really helpful if you can take your NHS number to to the vaccination centre. Just a practical point. It's easier to record the details. It doesn't matter if you can't find it. It's one of those things that you either have have safely registered in a, in a record or you just don't know what it is but it's really helpful to to record the nhs number on the system um 
You'd all have heard about the second dose and the delay in the second dose more recently. Again, this is the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunization's advice that if we delay the second dose to 12 weeks, we will make sure that more people are vaccinated. And as Magdus uh, already illustrated, that if we get a vaccination rate of 89% within two weeks of the first dose, that's got to be a massively important number. Um, so let's think about it in a positive sense. Of course, you know, if the vaccine supply was, if there wasn't any supply issues, etc., we'd of course been thinking about it in a different way. But we are where we are in terms of how we've got to deliver the first doses. So in our centre, we're busy delivering the home housebound um, elderly at the moment. We've but we're vaccinating 900 on Friday afternoon, those over 70 year olds and clinically vulnerable. And I'm sure that the, the Ilford Town Centre venue and the James Hawkey Centre are equally um, focused on doing as many vaccinations as possible. So in summary, I think we should remain hopeful. Redbridge is in a very strong position to get their numbers right, to get the figures right. I know it's been extremely difficult. We've been at the top of the table of the worst amount of rates I see the figures I'm proving and Gladys has told us that actually, you know, those numbers are coming down and that's through your hard work. It's through the council imposing those those messages. And I've seen uh, Jazz's messages on, on, on social media. That kind of message makes a difference. And this uh, this vaccine is entirely safe, as Magda has mentioned. It should be encouraged, but we should also be encouraged to continue to focus on the masks, the spacing and the cleansing and the hand washing. So that's really what we need to be focused on. Happy to take questions as are the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you, Dr Mehta. And now what we'll do is we'll move on to the uh, question and answer session. I really appreciate the way, you know, with the clarity that you guys have delivered uh, the messaging and made it so simple for us to understand. But obviously there's going to be concern, there's going to be questions. And um, of course, we've got uh, Magda, we've got Dr. Meta and uh, Gladys. I believe Councillor Santos is also on the panel. Um, Councillor Santos, uh, if you could. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm here, uh, Jazz, but unfortunately uh, my camera's not working. There's uh, some technical issues, so. Thank you. Um, and now Dennis, who's, who's on your screen. Dennis, I'll hand over to you uh, to basically chair the meeting for the question and answer session. Over to you, sir. So, super, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Asset. We've had almost 60, we've had 65 questions so far, and clearly we're not going to be able to go through every single one. So what I'm intending to do is to pick up the themes as best I can um, and get uh, three panellists, four panellists to to make some sort of responses so you'll have to excuse me if I sort of move you on a bit as well because there are quite a lot of themes to work through. One of the early themes and one of the strong themes has been around safety and also around the contraindications um, for vaccine and the allergic responses to, to vaccines and people who have allergic responses to other things other than just the vaccines. So I wonder Dr Magda whether or not you'd just like to to re to, to help us understand around contraindications about what people with immune immune suppression and things like anti TNFs sort of ought to be expecting to happen, um, the allergic response and what alternatives and what what are the arrangements for those sort of people, um, and I'll come back to Dr. Meta actually about process um, around sort of whether people are told what vaccine they're given and whether they are consenting to a particular vaccine or not. OK, so Dr. Magda, would you just sort of pick up for me what are the contraindications and immune suppression and what is happening around allergic responses? Fine, thank you. Um, so the contraindications at, at the moment are people who have had a history of very severe allergic reaction to a previous vaccine. But that is a severe allergic reaction. It's not a red arm. It's not feeling unwell for a few days. It's a true what we call anaphylactic reaction. You're collapsing and you need emergency care. Um, 
every person who gives that history needs a risk assessment with their doctor because for some people actually it's something that perhaps happened in childhood for example i'll tell my doctor i had a pen penicillin allergy but actually it was something my mother told me happened when i was a baby i don't know if it's genuine or not so so there's people who have severe allergic anaphylactic reactions to previous vaccines the other group um, that need to see their doctor are pregnant women because um, when vaccines are being developed, um, pregnancy is normally an exclusion for the trials. So the, the, there have been no large scale trials in pregnancy, but it's, it's one of those risk assessments with the doctor. So if you are extremely vulnerable and would do very badly if you caught COVID, your doctor can undertake a risk assessment with you as to whether you should be vaccinated or not. If you're breastfeeding, you can you can be vaccinated. Um, when the original guidance came out, there was some hes hesitancy about that, but that has been looked at in much more detail. Um, in terms of the safety, um, so like I say, about one in 10 people will get a reaction um, across the world um, with all of the major trials. I think there were two to three cases of this anaphylaxis with the vaccine, which is why the advice came in. And I'm very sorry, I can't remember what what your, the other part of the question was. Apologies. That's OK. No, no, it's about sort of the allergic response and whether or not there's a... Oh, immune system. Which, yeah. yeah which, and immune so if, if you have a condition that um, causes you to be immune compromised or you're taking drugs which affect your immune system, you are still advised to be vaccinated because of, because partly because, again, if your immune system is compromised and you get COVID, um, there is some evidence that you don't, don't do so well or could not do so well. Um, but there is also um, a very strong theme. And if you look on all of the specialist societies websites, they are advising vaccination. The only caveat is we don't know whether your response to the vaccine would be as good as somebody who has got a fully functioning immune system, but it is definitely a reason to be vaccinated. Super, thank you very much. So, Dr. Magda, when people turn up for their um, in, uh, vaccination, are they told what vaccine they're going to be going to be given? Um, and do they have any identification? Or do they take away with them anything that would help them identify um, or somebody else identify um, what their vaccine might have been and when they had it? Yeah, you should be given when you come. First, so when you come, it will depend what vaccination or vaccine the centre is using because different centres are using different vaccines, but they are if the effect of them is the same. But you should be given a card that tells you what the vaccine was. It should ideally have the batch number on it, as well as when you're likely to have your second dose, which, as we know, um, the Joint Committee on Vaccination says 10 to 12 weeks. Okay, Dr. Mehta, is that you? Yeah, yeah. Dennis, uh, really helpful. So, so yeah, the, the, the patients are, are given the card. Um, in in the Barking Side Centre, we've um, chosen to give them a certificate uh, mm. of graduation, almost, because to say, <laughs> look, this is your 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 passport to travel, even. But it lists the lists the batch number as as does the card. But the card, you've probably all seen the card. It's very tiny, and it, although it slips nicely into your wallet. It takes it's a challenge to sort of scribe on it. And, and if you're elderly, particularly, you may not be able to see it. So we've done an A4 certificate of vaccination, which deals with um, the, the date that it was given, the first and second dose and the batch number and the expiry date of that batch number. So it's just to make things a bit easier for, for, for our elderly people mainly. But you should be given um, uh, information on which vaccine you've had, the AstraZeneca or the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, as I said earlier, the housebound uh, elderly are, are, are offered the AstraZeneca Oxford vaccine primarily because it's easier to transport from home to home as opposed to the Pfizer vaccine, which is rather difficult. Um, and that's really the only only defining factor. But as Magda said, they're equally effective vaccines and 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 will go far in terms of protecting the population of Redbridge. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got some got quite a lot of um questions around priorities and prioritization and, and the use of the JVI, JVCI uh, listing. I'll come to those in a moment because there is a, a clear also other theme, which is about how do you people get contacted in Redbridge um, about their 
their need to um, book an appointment. Is this by post? In particular, it's the postal service um, issue locally that people want some reassurance about what sort of measures people are, you know, you're, you're being taken to uh, overcome that. So, so Dennis, the, the, the method of uh, notification is so in, in the Barking Sign Centre, we have got lists of over 80s, over 75s, over 70s and clinically vulnerable. And our reception staff literally calls all of them one by one. We call them and book them in on the screen there and then and book them in the 12 week appointment at the same time. So it's quite I mean, let's be practical. It's quite easy to forget this. If you're an 80 year old person, you might forget the dates. So we ring them and say, look, this is the time. And actually before before the date, we'll text them. Some people don't have mobile phones when you're 80. And, you know, we're trying to get through the message in every which way we can. And, and um, I hope that people will be reassured that you're attempting to do that. Is that also the first invitation that they get? Is or or are you just confirming their appointment time that they've already booked? So we, we we'd book them on the telephone. So right. that's the first appointment, uh, and then they would get a subsequent text message saying, "Remember your appointment." Yeah. Um, which in this day and age, if we if maybe we could post a letter also, but it may be slower actually than calling or texting this. Yes. Yeah, there is quite a lot of um, concern in the uh, the questions around um, the second dose scheduling. You've just suggested that you're actually s setting the the second dose schedule 12 weeks time um, there and then. Is that the common um, practice within Redbridge or yeah, yeah I mean that that's a that's a system approach so our system lends itself and we're as I said guided by the committee that advises the government that's 12 weeks and we we're, we're just booking those in a timely fashion and reminding people that that's the process so that's brilliant Dr Matt can I just ask you a question therefore around this sort of second dose of course change um what um how confident are you that that extension is going to continue to produce the sort of immune response reliability that you would want. So Dennis, so I, along with other clinical chairs uh, in North East London, we were asked to attend a meeting with Simon Stevens and Professor Wei Sin Shum, who's the chair of the immunology um, committee of the UK. So we are led by experts. We have to believe the experts. Um, we could all sit here and say, well, we don't trust them or this, that and the other. But actually, we're basing our decisions on the science. And and that's all I can reassure people with that we, you know, we, we these people wouldn't make it up. This is genuine scientific knowledge. And the UK is, is well renowned to rely on good evidence based medicine. Excellent. Um... I'm glad to hear that directly from you, which is the important bit. OK, um, once they've had their vaccine, um, are they free to go and do and see the grandchildren and do all of those things that they were wanting to do um, before all this started to happen? I'm afraid that's not the case, Dennis, <laughs> despite us all wanting to. And in fact, I've had that so many times from older people saying, can I now hug my grandchildren? And I'm afraid it's so heartbreaking at the moment. You can't because remember, 10 or 12 days later, this first dose gives you a good level of protection. However, it's not as high as 12 weeks later, you'll be up to that 95 percent. And also remember, we are in a national lockdown. So let's obey those rules and stick to the rules that our government's put on us. Gladys, did you have any sort of further points about that? And I'm then going to come on to um, uptake locally and whether or not there's any sort of um, evidence around um, black and ethnic minority um, groups being less forthcoming. So, so no, I, I again would like to just re-emphasize what um, Anil has said. As a director of public health, I'm also led by science. So we do have all the scientists reassuring us. And when we tell you what, what you know, the you really have to wait. I know it's hard for all of us, but let's just wait and work together. OK, that's that's brilliant. OK, thank you kindly. Um, there's, a, there's a particular sort of um, 
you've got three public, three mass vaccination centres or, or larger vaccination centres um, in the borough. Um, how did you come to choose the, those places and how did you choose times of opening? Because there are some people in the, in the questions who are sort of wondering why, in particular, Hawksley Hall was only open for a, a couple of days. Um, can you just... Yeah, so, yeah, of course, yeah, Dennis, I mean, remember, the, the population of Redbridge is over 300,000. Um, if, if you if you look at the, the town hall site, it's a large site. It allows lots of people to be vaccinated at any one time. It has some pros and cons, as does the James Hawkey Centre in, in the north of the borough, as and, and the logic applied to the Four World Cross Centre is that there are a lot of elderly folk who can walk around the corner to the surgery to get this vaccination rather than park up, have to walk. And remember, a lot of these are elderly in wheelchairs and Zimmer frames. Yeah. And it's very difficult for, 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 for relatives to, to logistically manage that parking dilemma that you and I have both been involved in over our time. It's difficult. Um, so, th but, but having three centers in Redbridge, I actually look at it as a very positive approach um, in across North East London. And in fact, if you look across the other two but neighboring boroughs, all in all, we've managed to secure six centers to vaccinate our population, which is a remarkable, it's almost like an aggressive approach by our clinicians to say, actually, because we've got the highest rates, we expect larger numbers of vaccination centers. And that's the logic. Um, I must say my clinical colleagues have been fantastic in pursuing the agenda and, and pushing the agenda that we really do need to get our population mass vaccinated and quickly. Yeah, entirely true. Those people who live on the edge of the borough who may have GP, who are registered with GPs over the borders in various other places, will their invites be affected or the timing of their invites or the place where they're going to be invited to be affected by that registration so so i think the key to this is that you know it's a, all vulnerable 80 year olds need the vaccine i don't care where they go and get it if they go to the town hall or they go to the james hawkey or they come to the full world cross medical center it doesn't matter the most important thing is the ingredient in that syringe um, the, the, the logistics of uploading their data onto the national spine or the national database is something that we can work out. But it's important to remember that actually, if you do live on the fringes, I mean, some of our residents who live in Woodford and Wanstead will be in the Waltham Forest sector. Yeah. It doesn't matter because there is going to be communication back to the gen general practitioner to say, by the way, your patient has been vaccinated, hence avoiding any errors of triple vaccination, for example. Couldn't help us. Talking of coverage, um, Gladys, perhaps if you could, have you got some some insights into what air coverage so far has been, recognising we're still early on in the uh, in the programme, um, and in particular whether or not there's any um, firm evidence around um, the uptake by black and ethnic minority groups in particular. Thank you, Dennis. So as uh, Dr. Mehta has said, once immunisation has been given, it doesn't matter where it has been given, it is uploaded onto a national immunisation system. So we have got access to that data. But remember, it's only, it's a, it's a very speedy process. And at the moment, what we are getting is the numbers. So in total, I can just say, it's about 18,000 people have been immunised. So again, it, as immunisation is happening every day, the number changes, so which is a quite, quite a good, good. So in Redbridge, we have over, uh, about 11,000 over 80 people who are over 80. The reason why we uh, target over 80 is because most people who died during the pandemic, during RP, age is the highest risk factor. So we sort of, our colleagues, NHS colleagues have already uh, immunised just about 8,000 over 80. So that's a really good progress that has been made. So unfortunately, at the moment, we do not have data by ethnic minorities. It's just, it will be moving. We will have more access to data. We have, as directors of public health, we do need to know. We also need to know who is not accessing the vaccine as well. So 
it will it will evolve and as we get more information then we will share and we will work with our communities good that's good well, i'm glad to glad to hear that this leads us on to prioritization um and now uh, you've already uh, alluded to both both dr magda and um uh, Dr. Mehta have both alluded to the fact that we're using the JVCI prioritization list that's based upon the science of and the purpose of the prioritization is to protect um, some of that NHS um, hospital based um, resource. So there are lots of questions around prioritization. When will I get this and, and some of that scheduling? So we'll come on to scheduling in a moment. But about the prioritization. Um, there are some specific people in the questions who are really interested in sort of what might be happening, particularly with school staff. Um, we won't, we'll talk about children in a moment, but people like school staff, housing staff, people with frontline sort of connections, care home staff. We're just wondering how, what are the arrangements for um, those? Do they fit into those sorts of prioritization lists? Uh, list and are there other arrangements that are coming in for some of them perhaps? Um, Dr Meta, perhaps you Yeah, so Dennis again, so oh, really? the, pri the priority groups are listed. Um, the number one priority groups are care home residents and over 80s. Number one, they are the ones that if they fall ill, they have a very low chance of survival and they will clog up hospitals. Number two is frontline health and social care workers. Now that that is primary care staff, reception staff, and anybody's front facing patient staff. Um, again, with the hospitals, uh, our hospital staff, um, and then the seventy five year olds and over. Now, but but however, however, that it, I mean, there needs to be some sort of logicalization. It's not never going to be perfect. You know, if you, if, you, if you ask me, the Metropolitan Police officers need to be done urgently, urgently. Now, they haven't featured in the in the priority groups. That is a decision that's been taken way above our heads. Uh, the teachers and the school staff need to be done urgently. That is a decision taken by committees. So we will enact what they've suggested we do. Of course, we all, all have our personal opinions. Um, but I think we've got to stick to the 10 groups of priority groups that have been listed. Yeah, OK, that's fine. Yeah, and that's that certainly helps. One particular group that, that has sort of featured a couple of times in the in the are people with children with special needs and or adults with special needs, learning disabilities. Um, where do they feature in the prioritization lists? Very high up. So our, our learning disability homes are very high up on the list. In fact, I had two learning disability homes that I vaccinated yesterday as very high up residents. So and, and, and the staff that look after them. So rest assured, Dennis, that that's a very high um, priority for us. Good. And the care home staff, um, the older elderly care home staff can have it at the same time at as the same time as the residents. Absolutely. But they also have access to the um, to any other route of, of immunization because not all of them will be on duty or. Um, yes. So, able to get so, it. so when I visited my local care home, I asked two days before that the staff that weren't on duty were asked to come in and they all attended, in which case I got that hit altogether. Yeah. And in addition, and in addition, from yes, the local so. authorities, um, the HRUT is vaccinating care home staff Absolutely. as well. Yeah. OK, so we do have that sort of addition because there are so it, it does seem from the questions that there are some um, care homes out there who haven't quite worked out that this is what happens. Um, with for staff in particular, that's fine. So that makes it much clearer. Well, right, thank you very much. Um, yes, prioritization and scheduling are clearly sort of part of it. There is one, there was one question which uh, I have to pose, I think sort of quite explicitly, just wondering about this prospect of people jumping the queue. In other words, not being prioritized um, because they've managed to respond to the um, question or the, the availability of unused doses at the end of sessions. 
I wonder if you might just sort of help us understand how you how you're dealing with those unused doses, how you're sort of responding and who are you offering it to? Yeah. Uh, again, a really, a really good question. Uh, I mean, the, the, the point is that number one rule, we cannot waste vaccine absolutely. because this this is gold dust and we mustn't waste vaccine. So general practitioners should have reserve lists of patients who they can call at short notice. And yes, the last Saturday morning at 6.30 in the morning, I was calling my 75, 79 year old saying, I know you're sitting just underneath 80, but do you think you can come down to the practice and I'll vaccinate you? So it's 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 that kind of game. We cannot waste it. I'd rather I'd rather be I'd rather be told off that I've done a 79 year old than bin it. And that I'm saying that you know loud and clear on a public uh, platform that I do not want to waste a single vaccine in Redbridge. But you are looking for people who are already quite high up on the, the prioritisation. So it's Absolutely. it isn't that the, the people are jumping the queue. So it isn't a 50 year old who's coming to, to, to jump well, the queue uh, in inverted commas. There are, plen there are plenty of 75 year olds to, to, to get to through yes. before you get to that 50 year old. Yes, entirely. Um, and that, and it, when do you think that the young, those younger age groups, those sort of lower um, levels of prioritisation are likely to start to, to be invited? What would, you, what would your guess be? And it is a guess, I understand that. <laughs> it's a guess, isn't it? Because so people keep asking the question. The two, the two deadlines in my mind are end of January for the care home residents and staff, mid-February for frontline staff, care workers and extremely vulnerable. And the quicker we work, the, yeah. the easier it will be. And I think, you know, we're, listen, I've committed to sort of putting all my energy into this uh, and, and encouraging my colleagues to do the same in the community across the, the trust. Um, and I think we have we've got a lot of hope to, to, to live on because, you know, we've got a committed bunch of clinicians and, and allied staff in Redbridge. Yeah. So 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 all of that staff, all those staff are committed and they're they're continuing to be available. And clearly from what your description of your day today so far um, is that you've been busy doing that, presumably it is the supply of, of the vaccine at the moment that is limiting some of that sort of availability of um, opportunity. I think we've heard all, all of us have heard today even that there's been some rejigging of the supply uh, from the European plant where Pfizer is making its vaccines. Uh, and again, that is that that is process that we will not be uh, uh, we, we won't get the full information until we get the supply of vaccine. So I think we that's all we, we know so far. That's that's good. Um, we've already talked about the fact that having had the vaccine, you're still going to have to consider dis social distancing. You're still going to need to keep at home at this at this point, two meters away from everybody else, um, face ma face coverings, and keep on washing hands. Um, I've gone and forgot what the question was now. Sorry. <laughs> um, so it is about sort of how we enable us ourselves just to continue to, to find out um, whether or not there is a vaccine circulating. So I'm going to talk to Gladys briefly, therefore, about LFD, the, the lateral flow device, which is the ACE, which is the, the test you're using for the asymptomatic um, identification of people carrying um, the virus. Um, What's the is that the purpose of the lateral flow device approach? Um, okay. and, and how effective uh, effectiveness is, you know, sort of reliable, sort of it's validity, reliability and sensitivity, specificity in technical terms that I think we're looking for. So LFD testing is only one of the toolkits for us to fight this pandemic. It's not just the only one, but we are very fortunate we have got these these have been going through trials when we have got very high prevalence in the community like we have at the moment we are identical because and also we've got the new variant so what we're doing is these are asymptomatic testing so you know there are a lot of people in this country there are about 17 million people who have no choice but have got to work like dr meta dr magda smith and lots of frontline workers in our all areas people do have to work so what we are offering is a test for asymptomatic that while we have been testing in Redbridge from from December, what we found was 10% of the people who we tested were uh, 
they've tested positive. So that alone goes to show that there are a lot of people who don't even know they have had it. So what we've done is we've told them to isolate and their contacts to isolate. So what they've done is they've kept themselves away for 10 days and they've broken the chain of infection. So that is one, one of the ways of getting uh, the LFD testing. So we are increasing our uh, LFD testing. As um, Jas had said, you know, we are doing some targeted work around uh, communities where people would naturally go to a site. So we are expanding our testing capability in Redbridge as well. Really, that is as one of the toolkits to get get this going. OK, thank you. Thank you. That, that's that's helpful in that sort of um, sense. OK, Dr. Um, Dr. Magda, I've just got one final question at this sort of point um, around safety, and it's about sort of the longer term. Now, you alluded to the fact that all the all the all, all the um, the trials had been um, rigorously evaluated around safety, um, and you've already identified that there is the ongoing surveillance of side effects and adverse effects as they come through. Um, there's one question um, in particular um, that was posed, which was about longer term impact on fertility. Absolutely. Have, we, have, we got, um, have we got any evidence and all of? No, I mean, so the, 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 there have been concerns raised about fertility and um, I believe it's because something uh, there's a um, the the, the body reacts to recognition of particular proteins and viruses are particular proteins and there is a placenta protein which is similar to the virus protein but not the same and I think people have been putting it out there that this is that it's the same it looks the same and so if you give the vaccine the body will then react to the placenta protein but the body is smarter than that it, the, it generates the, these immune responses following vaccinations. The point of the vaccine is to get a very, very targeted immune response. It has to look exactly like the virus, yeah. not something that looks a little bit like it, which which is, I think, where these concerns about okay. fertility have come that's, from. That's really helpful. OK, um, I'm going to stop there because we're almost out of time in that sort of sense, I think. Um, we were about an hour. Just to say that we've had over 100 questions posed, but I think we've probably in both your presentations and in the themes that we've managed, we were already covering to have covered most of those. My colleagues have been busy sort of answering them on the uh, the Q&A as well. So there will be a publication of, of this on the council website so that people can go back and peruse that um, at some point in the, the near future. I'll hand back to uh, to Councillor Actwell um, for uh, the final bits. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you uh, to Magda. Thank you to Dr. Meta and Gladys. Um, thank you, everyone else, you know, who joined us. Um, almost 250 people joined us today. Um, I think the, it's, it's an extremely busy period at the moment and everybody's working flat out. It's clear there are lots of concerns, but it's also clear that the experts are unequivocal in their response that this is a safe vaccine. This is the way forward. We must deliver this. We're now almost a year into the pandemic. It's been absolutely challenging year for all of us. I know this lockdown has come at a very difficult time, especially when it's been cold, it's been dark, but many of us need the comfort of seeing friends and family the most. And that's what we're clinging on to. So I would certainly ask uh, you all to please stay strong and keep following the guidelines as the doctors have said. This is, there is a light at the end of the tunnel in the form of this vaccine. And we must be patient for, you know, it's gonna take a little bit of time, but we're gonna be there. And in the meantime, we must all play our part, every single one of us, to stop the spread of the virus. Together, we will overcome COVID-19. Thank you very much for joining today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, well done, everyone. That was a brilliant session.